welcome to this second day of things you gotta know when coming out later in life. Um, we're gonna talk about catalyst and first queer relationships today. And this is the best of my work, as I have said before. Um, we're gonna be talking about the coaching program that I offer on day four. Um, and then if you have like real questions that you want answered and you want to feel like what it feels like to be actually in the coaching program with me, please join us um, on Thursday evening. We're going to have a VIP session so that you can ask all your questions and you can feel what the support like feels like in the group setting. Um, as I said, I believe in the power of the universe and you're here for a reason. Um, and as I said before, that Barb and I have been in your shoes, we have walked this walk. I always say the best coaches are the ones that played the game, and Barb and I have played the game. I came out in 2006, and she came out to 2007. So as you know, I've created a lot of things. I've been with a lot of people. I have a lot of testimonies, and if you want to go read them, we can drop the link in. And this is who I am personally. And professionally, this is my qualifications here. We've talked about those before. You can read them later if you would like. And Barb also has personal and professional background as well. Um, I love this picture. Uh, this is um, one of the, we had a retreat uh, in the beginning of December, right, Barb? And um, this is one of the clients from our, our Lotus Group Coaching Program. <laughs> She's very tiny, and so they hug each other. It's a really great picture. So what is a catalyst? Um, and here you see the actual physical chemical reaction to a catalyst. And so in the later in life uh, community, we often have what is known as a catalyst. Why this is not changing pages, I don't know. Um, so in science term, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction. In human terms, a catalyst is an event or a person that precedes great change. So in the later in life community, a lot of us have what is a catalyst. And so a lot of people start coming out when they have a major life event happen. So a major life event includes maybe a death of a parent, um, uh, a child dying, an accident. A lot of people come out after they get sober. A lot of people come out after they have a serious health scare. And so there's all kinds of reasons. Like there's a major catalyst. A lot of people come out after they get divorced. There's a major catalyst lit uh, lytic shift that happens for folks. So I would say that happens to about 50% of our community. And Barb's going to talk about the other 50%. <laughs> yep. So I, she had one. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I like to call the big C catalyst, right? Yeah. Big C catalyst usually means um, when we're talking about a cat like catalyst, it means a person. So that's when we're just sort of, you know, plodding through life, do, 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 live in the status quo. And then all of a sudden, in she comes, and uh, we meet a woman who changes everything for us um, and uh, develop really strong feelings or fall in love with, with the woman when we didn't expect it. And it causes us to completely reconsider um, our sexuality and what we need. Um, catalyst, I, like Marie said, I had a catalyst relationship myself. Um, I fell in love with a, a woman, an out lesbian, um, who I had been friends with for about a year and a half and, uh, you know, had always considered myself to be, uh, straight as an arrow. Now, of course, you know, a little further down my journey and reflecting back and doing this work. There were definitely signs along the way, but I was asleep to my sexuality. And um, catalyst relationships, you know, just like we talked about the chemical reaction, uh, the the change is intense. It's and it's rapid. It comes with the absolute highest of highs and the lowest of lows that you can feel. And the highs, well, let me tell you, they are just unlike anything else that you have probably ever felt. 
Um, they're, they're characterized by deep emotional connections, physical connections, um, spiritual connections. And um, just like, you know, when you fall in love, it can be all consuming. And that's typically what the highs are like with a catalyst relationship. And, uh, you know, one of your guests early on in the podcast, and I'll give a link to it later, um, Miriam Grace talked about this a lot uh, when it comes to why are women so good at developing these intense connections with each other? Well, in general, you know, women tend to be better at fostering those loving kinds of bonds. We're, we're good at all the things that are needed to create bonds. So like, for example, we're better with language. We talk about our feelings more easily. Um, we are more comfortable with vulnerability. Uh, we do things like um, hold eye contact. We speak in loving, soft voices. We um, are good at comforting. Uh, we're good at physical touch. Um, and, you know, women understand women's pleasure. So when you get two women <laughs> coming together in relationship doing these things it's kind of we call it the doubling effect it's uh it's like we you, you've got twice the power of those those um activities that create those bonding chemicals that cause us to uh cause us to create those connections so the feelings are very 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 intense can you say um, a little bit about what type of feelings that um what type of chemicals like dopamine or yes yes yeah. for sure and like all of the the activities i've just described those things that we are good at um you know like uh, oxytocin for one of them um you know the that bonding chemical that we experience um often when we have children or when we fall in love um, are fostered by all of those things. Um, dopamine, which is a reward system. So the more I see her, the better I feel and the more I want her. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so our, our brains kind of uh, serotonin, serotonin, which makes us uh, feel like we have an extreme sense of well-being. Um, so the more we interact with her, the more we have those feelings, the more we see her, the more we want um and that's what causes those highs to to just really rock it and go extremely high however just like you can't have the light without the dark and the peanut butter without the jelly the highs come with the lows and um you know oftentimes you know, when a catalyst relationship, especially if it's unexpected, you didn't know this was going to happen to you. And whoopsie doodle, I've fallen in love with my best friend or I've fallen in love with a woman. Um, it's all happened before your life and her life is actually ready to be in relationship and, and be committed to one another. So, you know, it creates a lot of turbulence in in women's lives um you know it, it it's it disrupts uh, a marriage it disrupts a family uh unit um it's uh it can disrupt so many other things within your life so along with all of those wonderful high highs and that you know love that you're experiencing like no other love you've experienced before you're also a lot of other things are quickly very becoming unraveled which creates an enormous amount of stress and um you know the circumstances around that relation to ship too can be filled with so many questions it's like how did i get he's like that talking head song how did i get here <laughs> you know? um uh, how did this happen to me um does this mean i'm gay does what what does this mean for uh what does this mean for my marriage what does this mean for my family what does this mean for my personal security um you know, do I have to identify it as a lesbian now or gay or can I be another letter in the alphabet? I don't know. So there's really complex feelings that are mixed in like with the good and the bad. 
and uh, it creates a ton of stress and on new relationships that can be the breaking point so not always some catalyst relationships survive and endure a lot of times they do not it is very difficult for new relationship to um to come through all of those difficulties and all of all of the 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 grief and the um the hardship that comes along with undoing a long-term marriage so uh when it breaks down if it breaks down and when it breaks down the end of that catalyst relationship can feel like the most difficult thing i've ever experienced really um and remember we we're just talking about all of those chemicals that we're making in our brains when we have those kinds of relationships that in the the, the dopamine the serotonin the oxytocin and then she's not there anymore so it actually is akin to going through a drug withdrawal mm -hmm. you um can feel not just like this an intense sadness but like an actual physical bodily response and um this is a point where some people become sick um this is where things like sleep disturbance come in um just uh, there's a, just a massive shift in your brain chemicals so it's it becomes very very tricky you know we leave for those of us who have had catalyst relationships um and decide hey you know what I, I, I can't, I can't uh, live with myself without no without pursuing this because I need to know this thing about me. So for example, like in my situation, I chose to leave my marriage because I, I just couldn't, I had to, I had to explore these feelings. And it's not like my marriage was so great anyway. <laughs> so so I ended up leaving what was a very comfortable place. And I think a lot of women have similar experiences. They leave the, even if it's a marriage that's not great, um, it's familiar and it's comfortable and they, they rock it out of that situation um, for, to pursue the promise of greater love. And if that catalyst relationship ends, we end up experiencing something called disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief, I think, is uh, best described as grief that, for the most part, other people do not understand or have sympathy for. Would or, you say that? Uh, okay? Yeah, dis that, exactly. Or disenfran disenfranchised grief when is when you're grieving something, like Barb said, that no one understands or that no one um uh, has experienced. So a lot of times our friends and family that even if they know about the catalyst relationship, they don't understand the depths of the loss of the catalyst relationship. Mm -hmm. And sometimes no one knows about it. You're the only person that knows about this relationship. And when this relationship ends and you're not able to talk about it to a friend or or a family member or someone that you love and you care about and you have not built up your queer community yet, the end of the catalyst relationship leaves you wondering, you know, like you, you have so much grief and you have no one to share it with. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, there's other things that happen as well, right Barbara? Yeah, for sure. And, and I think one of the most um, grief filled parts is, you know, in the end of a catalyst relationship, your newfound queerness has been so tied with the catalyst that when the catalyst goes away, it leaves a big hole in understanding of, well, who am I? Um, the, am, am I actually a queer person? Um, or was it just her? So um, it really shakes the foundation of everything, not only just like, you know, the structure of your life, but who you are at your core. And, um, you know, we've written here, we meant so much to each other. How did it go so wrong? You know, that is a, that's a very, we hear that sentiment um, often mm -hmm. from women 
going through that breakup. So, um, yes, that's we often go into our old trauma responses when we go through the end of our uh, first same sex relationship. And uh, one of those responses is often people isolating themselves. And I don't know if any of you find this relatable. I know I do that, uh, you know, when you're struggling, there, there can often be a, 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 an impulse to turn inwards instead of leading, leaning outwards into your community of support. And it can also be really challenging to lean into your normal community of support if they're you know, straight and they don't understand the significance of what you've gone through. So even your most loving family members, you know, your, your parents, your siblings, you know, your friends who you've had for a long time, you know, they love you and they care about you and they hate to see you suffering and they don't get it. So this is why it is so critically important. Emery, I think if our, our friends here take away anything from this five, five days, day yeah. <laughs> it's that leaning in to queer community and especially to other women who have had maybe not the exact same experience of you that that you've had but similar journeys parallel journeys where they can understand you can that's where you start to be seen instead of hiding away and isolated and once you're seen and understood that's when healing um can begin so the end of a catalyst relationship, um, you know, I think one of the super important things is that it's a time to really focus inward on self care. I think that's probably true of relationships, uh, like the end of any kind of relationship, whether it's uh, straight or queer, but it's a time to to start taking care of yourself, seeking LGBTQIA affirming support, um, professional medical help if you need it um especially if the grief that you're experiencing is preventing you from living and functioning in your daily life um you know we talk about we just talked about um going back into trauma responses so it's really super super important as well to lean into some of the really healthy habits meditation i mean that's something we do with our groups uh weekly um exercising um leaning away from the harmful habits like uh consuming alcohol um overeating um those kinds of things that ultimately might feel better in the moment but don't serve us and um paying real a lot of attention to the quality of your sleep and if you've ever had sleep struggles you know like sleep affects the whole rest of your life right mm -hmm. if you're if you're not sleeping well, it can just ruin everything or sleeping too much. That's another one. Uh, the other side of that coin, you might have insomnia or you might just feel like, you know, spending 16 hours a day with the blankets over your head. So I just want to say something about LGBTQIA plus supporting their professionals. Mm -hmm. So a lot of therapists will claim that they're supportive to the LGBTQIA plus community. And some truly are, mm -hmm. but some are not. Mm -hmm. And um, they haven't done their work. And um, I'll just, I'll tell you my own personal story. Um, I went to two therapists um, trying to get support for my feelings around being gay. Um, the first one was a straight woman and she had a very good reputation. I was sent to her by someone who was, who was a lesbian. And um, she said to me, I said, well, I'm coming to you because I think you, I'm, you know, I'm gay. And I was married at the time for a while. And she said, so have you ever slept with a woman? I said, no. And she never mentioned it again. <laughs> it again. I laugh now. But yeah. I also was like, well, I guess I didn't pass the litmus test. And so she never mentioned it again. The second, the second time I mentioned it in therapy was with my therapist, who, by the way, happened to be a lesbian. I didn't pick her because she was a lesbian. It was our marriage therapist my husband and I went to. Um, and also, she had been my own therapist, and she was actually really, really helpful for me in other areas of life. So we actually developed a really, really good 
um, friendship, well, you know, client, client, professional experience. And um, so in our marriage counseling, I said, I, you know, maybe it's because I'm gay. And um, so she was like 70 at the time. I was maybe like uh, 48, 47. And um, she sort of chalked it up to my um, relation, my difficult relationship I had with my mother. <laughs> So you can insert the eye roll here because almost yep. her woman has heard that. And um, and she ignored it. Now, <clears throat> here I am going to marriage counseling. My ex and I are struggling in my marriage. Wouldn't you think the therapist would have paid attention when somebody says, hey, I think I, I said gay. I didn't even say my, may not be straight. I said, I think I might be gay. Um, so when I came out the third time, it was to the same therapist and, um, and she gave me some okay advice. Um, I still trusted her. I didn't, you know, but, and she also apologized for having ignored the fact that I told her that I was gay two years prior. So, um, but she also told me in the course of the, you know, after coming out and she was pretty supportive of that she told me that my ex-husband and I could have a mixed orientation marriage. And a mixed orientation marriage means when somebody is not straight and somebody is um, straight. And um, I do, like now I think of that, and so for a while I was going in, in on that because that's what she said to me. And the thing is, is that that mixed orientation marriage would mean that both my ex-husband and I would give up something significant and important and, mm -hmm. and including sex. Um, and so I'm just going to say that, you know, I think Barb, we need to write a blog post about questions you need to ask your LGBTQ. Yeah. And you know, yeah, we're going to do that after I just oh, settle. <laughs> yeah. A few things that, you know, I, I think we need to, that you've mentioned that you should really just underline here. One is if you're going to marriage counseling, oftentimes the marriage counselor what's their interest what have you hired them to do save your marriage save your marriage they're not interested in your queer journey they're interested in like saving your marriage and and barb hit the nail on the ted because our my therapist our therapist really liked my ex-husband and i mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. human beings mm -hmm. and so she was very very vested in saving our marriage right right yeah. The other thing too is, you know, you mentioned, you know, a therapist saying, hey, well, you think you're gay? Have you ever slept with a woman? And you're like, no. Well, that's can like, we point out what a ridiculous thing that is to say. Because, and I've heard you say this before, Emery, we do not ask young people, like, and they're all <laughs> hot and heavy for that. Oh, you're heterosexual? Person. Have you slept with somebody? No. <laughs> oh, well, maybe you're gay. Like, it's that is not a requirement of you know defining your sexuality <laughs> like no it is not a retire a requirement so thanks barb i forgot that one you're right yeah, yeah important so um okay so moving on because i know we have questions there's probably questions we've got to uh cover here but um i just want to emphasize that you know recovering from your catalyst relationship it absolutely takes time uh it is a process um and it requires a ton of self-care but it's also a really exciting time because it becomes a period of self-discovery so this is a time then when you get to explore who you are what your real desire is what you need in relationship um, and what you want without reference to the wants or needs of anybody else, not your husband, not your kids, not your catalyst, nobody, just you, what do you need? And it becomes a period of, I think, you know, it can be a period of experimentation, dating, figuring out what you want. Like when I came out of my catalyst relationship, when I was ready to date, I set up a web, one dating website to date men and one dating website to date women. And that was my big experiment to see, okay, <laughs> let's see, let's see how this shakes out. And it did not take me long to cancel the membership for the dating site for men. So <laughs> I figured that out I pretty think quick. That's actually brilliant. <laughs> I really do. I think because you also had your two different, pro one profile and one, one 
you know, dating app. So you weren't making anybody confused. You were just yes. looking for men on one and looking yeah. for women on the other. Exactly. And so, kept it separate and, and kept it clean. The control. You had a very good control. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And date, and not just like, so if, if, if that aside too, there are all different kinds of women out there. There are femme women, there are chapstick lesbians, there are butch women. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, 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 uh, people within that queer spectrum and, and trans, it, trans men trans, trans women men. I mean, you know and it, and you can date all kinds of people to see you know see sure. who you feel wonderful with <laughs> yes exactly and and learn what it is and and each experience you have gets you closer to learning about what it is you need and want and that's a big part of the work that I do with our coaching program is helping um the people within our program figure that stuff out mm -hmm. and make those definitions and those lists <laughs> you know i love my lists so um and then i guess the last thing is you know uh, number one most important thing community 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 we cannot say it enough it is the single most important piece of advice find a group of people that will embrace you with your lgbtqia plus journey other queer people who, um, who, like I said before, you will feel seen with them and understood by them and whose journeys are parallel to yours. If you are interested in learning more about Catalyst relationships, we actually have a very, oh gosh, we made this, what, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago? Yeah, that was a while ago, yep. Yeah, um, so uh, this is a free guide that goes into much more detail about um, overcoming the end of your first lesbian relationship. So that is at annemariezanzel.com um, in the coming out resources section, that's in the main menu. So it's a drop down menu, you'll be able to find it super easily. And uh, this is really well worth a read. Um, even, if, even if you haven't had that first um, lesbian relationship yet, um, it still helps to put a lot of things into perspective and is just good knowledge to have. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention a couple other. Oh, and then if you want to listen to a couple of people that went through Cat Have Catalyst, Miriam is a good friend of mine. Um, she is known as Miriam Grace on the internet. Um, she is a psychotherapist that is out of England. She is a particular kind of psychotherapist, but I can't remember right now. Um, we, that article, we talked about this and, um, the article getting over a catalyst relationship that I have on my website, and I can drop that in the group too, yep. is, um, it, Miriam and I talk about getting over that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we also talk with Barb's story. You can hear Barb's story on, um, that as well. Um, also too, um, I want to mention two things. Uh, sometimes catalyst relationships don't end. Um, I didn't have a catalyst relationship, but I had a confirmer relationship. So my wife has been out for um, almost 40 years and um, I was coming out when I met her. Um, she was only out 32 years then, but, um, but you know, um, and so she was my first relationship with a woman. And so we've had a lot of ups and downs and um, I have navigated a lot. We've navigated a lot of things together um, in the group. You will find that I put up some of our perspectives. Um, she wrote a really great article. So if you're dating somebody who has been out in the community a while, my my wife wrote an article called when this longtime lesbian dated the newbie and um, because she definitely has a perspective about it um, and also I often find that two women who leave um, relationships like they're two women who fall in love with each other and like are often um, and they leave their husbands for each other um, oftentimes they sort of go through that journey together and they end up together, not always forever, but sometimes for a while. So not every catalyst um, relationship is doomed to end. So if you're somebody who has a catalyst and you're like, oh no, <laughs> people navigate things all different kinds of ways.